Hello, welcome back to Furious Driving, although today it should be more a case of furious sailing because I'm on board the preserved paddle steamer, the Medway Queen, one of the Dunkirk little ships and one of the very last of the pleasure steamers that used to paddle around Britain's coastal waters in the first half of the 20th century particularly in the interwar years, the 1920s and 30s, a day out on a paddle steamer going around from some seaside town to another seaside town, it was the big thing to do. Everyone did it. And there were literally hundreds of these ships sailing from one coastal town to the next. But back in the days when entire factories were closed for the week and everyone had the same week off, there were no cheap package holidays to Spain and that kind of thing, this was the thing you did. You got on a train or a charabank or an omnibus down to the coast and you got on a paddle steamer and you spent the next 14 hours or so having a beer and looking at the seaside. And it was one of the most popular British pastimes from April to around October time. These things were plugging away up and down the coast non-stop. And so in 1923, the new Medway Steam Packet Company commissioned the Isla Shipbuilding Company on the Tyne to build this, the Medway Queen. And on April 24th, St George's Day, 1924, she was launched. Now the ship cost £21,500 in 1923, which was quite a lot of money back then. But if you look down the side, you can see it is riveted construction, but they're flush head rivets on the side, giving a fairly smooth uh, hull to the ship. Looking at the superstructure and the internal walls, it's round head rivets, which is a bit cheaper and easier to do. In a precursor to modern day cruise vessels, island hopping from one tropical location to the next, the Medway Queen and her sisters would have done something very similar around the British coast. The Medway Queen's regular routes were between Strood, South End on Sea, Hearn Bay, calling in at Sun Pier in Chatham, and Sheerness in North Kent. So not quite Mauritius, but very, very similar indeed. Now these days out were astonishingly popular. Up here on the deck and in the saloons below, which I'll show you in a moment, they'd have housed around 800 people on a day out. So this little hut that I'm sheltering from the wind behind so you can actually hear a word I'm saying, is the bridge. Not that bit underneath that you look at here, but a little thing on top. Whoever was steering the ship, rain or shine, was stood up there in the open elements, apart from during the war years, which we'll come to in a second, when this had quite an exciting time. But this here is a staircase, and that little area in front, which I'll show you a cutaway because I can't stand in front of the microphone, the wind is just devastating it. Um, it's got a captain's day office, so he'd have little charts and things and, I don't know, smoke his pipe in there. Whatever captains do of a day. But whoever's, whoever had the task of steering this thing and driving it was stood up on top of there, with the exception of one moment, which I'll show you now. In 1936, she had a minor run-in with a pier, and that meant the forend had to be rebuilt. So they added a front rudder to make manoeuvrability a lot better in port, because the paddles are linked. They only drive forwards and they drive backwards, so turning this thing is a bit of a mission. So adding this thing meant it could actually steer into park a little bit more easily. Interestingly, the original 1923 ship's wheel is made of brass, which lived up there, but the 1936 uh, forward wheel is made of wood. I don't know why that's interesting, I thought it was. Well, I've walked down the main stairs and I'm here on the main deck. And this is what greets you as you walk past that bulkhead just there. This is a double compound diagonal steam engine built by the Ayla Shipbuilding Company in Troon. And it is a monster of a device. My first question when I came on board here was, oh, so there used to be walls here, I assume. So keep people safe and away from the large reciprocating engine. No, it was always just a rail so people could stand here with a beer, or a cup of tea, probably a beer to be honest, and watch the engine turn. It must have been absolutely gobsmacking and quite mesmerizing watching something this big churning away so close. I can't believe health and safety would possibly allow it, but apparently with these raised areas here, you can still have it because it's a historical thing. I'll walk you down there in a moment because it is quite fantastic. And here at this brass desk, guided by this telegraph from the bridge, is whoever was in charge of the actual engine was sitting here on the levers controlling forward, backward speed. So someone's job was to sit here all day running the engine itself. And through that wall just there, behind those gauges, was the boiler. It's currently not in the ship because this has had quite a checkered history of being sunk a lot. And so there's currently no boiler. But in 1938, the original coal-fired boiler was taken out and replaced with an oil-fired one, making the ship much faster to refuel, more efficient, I think more powerful as well. We're going to have a look at that, don't we? That's quite impressive.
so here we are below the waterline in the ship that's not complete at the moment there would be more floor panels obviously for safety and convenience and there will be a lot more pipe work as well making this engine actually function the plan is one day to have it running again unfortunately it's a volunteer operation and money has come from the lottery and from other heritage grants but it is going to take an awful lot of cash to make this work some more i do hope we see it one day though walking forward you can see here from the crank of the engine we have the drive shaft running under this hump in the uh, floor here out to the paddle wheel itself so this could be seen operating probably wasn't on a regular sea day but this is the paddle wheel this is a steel paddle wheel and interestingly these have movable floats those are the things that actually do the paddling are called floats and the reason they're movable is that they go into the water pushing firmly and driving the ship forwards then as they lift out of the water they have less drag and don't carry the water on top of the blade so they are more efficient and more powerful so why paddle wheels when they'd known for a good 70 odd years that propellers were way more efficient i did a fair bit of research and the best i could come up with was just that they're quite fun aren't they it makes it into more of a spectacle more of an occasion if you're on a paddle steamer rather than just a steamer and so it's it's more of a thing to go on so this is one of the paddle boxes. There's a paddle box on each side of the ship and one of these areas front and back of the paddle itself. So the paddle is behind there. And these areas were used for toilets, for storage, for offices, variously through the years. Like one ladies, one crews, two men's toilets. Here's the, uh, the forward end of that same paddle box. This one's been painted up. You'll notice the decking above us is all brand new. That was from Heritage Lottery funding and possibly some EU funding as well. But this cavern of a room, the biggest space on the ship, was originally the boiler room. In fact, it still is the boiler room. It just hasn't got a boiler in it right now. If you see those large red um, containers at the other side of the room, there's two more underneath my feet right now these are the fuel tanks originally this was coal fired so there was a team of men shoveling coal manually into the boiler but in 1938 it converted over to oil fired making the whole operation far more efficient this little space here was the galley this was the only kitchen for the entire ship 800 people on board and this was where all the food came from it must have been hot as hell in this little space but this is not changed in terms of dimensions since the 20s uh, there would have been a big i think i believe it was a coal fired or oil fired kind of a range just here and well i'll be honest from what i understand of these trips mostly it was drinking that went on rather than eating so there were more bars than kitchens So this is the upper aft lounge. Most of the internal space of the ship was given over to seating and uh, tables for families, friends, groups to sit and just yeah, enjoy time together and to buy food and drink and obviously spend money on the ship. They weren't dark back then. Right now below me is the lower aft saloon and ahead of me are the upper and lower saloons as well. Sorry, that's, that's the uh, gangplank creaking in the background. It's quite a weird noise and I'm hoping to sort that pretty soon. This is the upper forward saloon. It makes sense, we're in the front, it's the upper one, it's a saloon. And they're working from old photos and they're putting this back as it would have been when the ship was new. These are actually recommissioned or repurposed uh, church pews. And looking at old photos, there used to be a bar along the front of it. So this was, quite, again, a busy, busy room back in the, when the ship was pleasure cruising. But all that came to an abrupt end in 1939 when the war broke out. It was quite significant and put a bit of a crimp on the old uh, cruising around the, the coast activities. And especially so when the Navy requisitioned the ship in October 1939 and it was converted into a minesweeper. 
which took actually quite a lot of work. It wasn't just painted grey and some uh, big nets were hung off the back. It was painted grey, but they actually cut the entire rear saloon off the ship to install all the mine sweeping equipment. It also came to £12 pound a gun, anti-aircraft guns, and finally an enclosed bridge for the poor guys standing outside in all weathers steering the thing. Now after gun trials off Sheerness, and I, I won't be the one to say that shooting naval guns at Sheerness is possibly the best thing for it, um, it gained the naval number N48, later J48, and set to sea with a ninth minesweeping flotilla. By that winter, 1939 to 1940, was incredibly cold. The estuaries of Thames and the Medway actually froze, and so they had to run out of the estuaries with a tug in front, breaking the ice ahead of the paddle steamers, because all of these old paddle steamers were requisitioned for minesweeping. There was an entire flotilla of minesweeping paddle steamers at the time. There were dozens of them, literally. Come the spring of 1940, they found that harsh winter had done damage to the ship, so it had to be brought back into dock and have some repairs done. So it was brought back to Chatham Dogs, literally just about half a mile over that way, where it was repaired and had degaussing strips added to deter magnetic mines. After repairs, she went to the 10th minesweeping paddle steamer flotilla, and then she got an interesting call. On the 27th of May 1940, the Medway Queen was at anchor in the sea on lookout duty. It was a fairly common duty that were given to these ships. Um, when she got the call to head over to Dunkirk in order to embark some waiting troops, that was all that was said, nothing more than that. So after taking on supplies, she joined up with HMS Sandown, HMS Thames Queen, HMS Gracie Fields, HMS Queen of Thanet, HMS Princess Elizabeth, HMS Laguna Belle and HMS Brighton Belle, and they headed over to France. But when they got to La Pen beaches, they couldn't believe what they saw. Just lines and lines of men up to their necks in the water waiting to get onto ships. So under covering fire from a light cruiser called HMS Calcutta, the crew of the Medway Queen put down the lifeboats and they brought on uh, must have been around a thousand men before heading back to Britain. They were aiming for Dover, but when they got as far as the Goodwin Sands, they actually came upon an air raid happening, and Medway Queen actually used her guns and got her first kill and brought down an enemy aircraft. Unfortunately, while this was going on, the Brighton Bell drifted and hit a sunken wreck and tore the bottom out of herself, and so she started going down. Luckily, Medway Queen was on hand and came alongside and took off all her crew and all of the rescue troops, so now massively overloaded with around double her complement, she headed to Ramsgate and managed to get everyone to safety without a single life lost. Now because she'd been converted to oil in the 30s it meant she could be refueled and restocked very quickly and over the next few days actually did a total of seven crossings. The later ones were independent. They stopped going in en masse because it was targeted, it was difficult to arrange, it was fast to just travel alone, go fast as you can, go solo, get there, get back. Now the crewmen of the ship at the time reckon they took back 7,000 men in total on this one ship. Uh, Navy records reckon it's a different number but the people on the ship I wouldn't like to argue with because they were there, they were actually here counting things on and off and things were very confused at the other end. Now one downside of being a paddle steamer is the massive double wakes, it's really easy to see from an aircraft and the second night of the Dunkirk evacuation it was a still calm night so the German air crews could see the ship really clearly but they hit on the idea of throwing oily sacks over the stern which broke up the water and diffused the wake and so they managed to get by and sneak through without being shot at. So later on the Medway Queen was awarded this plaque, Dunkirk 1940, all the little ships got it. In fact, she was the biggest of the little ships and rescued the most men outside of the actual Navy vessels. Now here we have the boiler room.
So here you have her, the Medway Queen, 100 years old in just three years time. Will she be sailing again under our own steam by then? Probably not, but at least there's a dedicated team of volunteers working towards the day when maybe she can.